as you've heard me probably say a number of times as you read Paul's letters, one of the things that we notice is that in them, you can always kind of break it down into the fact that in the first part of whatever letter he's writing, it's going to be a lot of doctrine. It's going to be a lot of teaching about Jesus or something like that. And then in the last half, it's going to talk about the practical things that you can do with that knowledge. And we see that here in our, our passage in Ephesians 4, where we see Paul is challenging us to live in a way that reflects the character of Christ that he had established in the first three chapters and is now inviting us to a life of unity, honesty, kindness, and love. And as he addresses the Ephesians, Paul calls them and us as well to put off the old ways of deceit and anger and bitterness and instead embody a new life grounded in God's love and his truth. And we're reminded that we are one body, sharing in the spirit, so our actions towards one another matter deeply. And so as we read, let us continue to, to think about how these words invite us to reflect Christ's love in our own lives and how they invite us to grow in love and kindness Towards one another. So let's read from Ephesians chapter 4 today. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's go to him in a brief word of prayer. And we'll dig in. Gracious Heavenly Father God, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you for the way in which you grow us through it. Allow us today to come and grow and know a little bit more of who you are and who we are and the expectations that you have for us. Father, be with the one who speaks. He is a vile sinner, but he has an amazing Savior. And now, Father, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. My first calling was in Manning, South Carolina as a youth pastor there. And uh, I had been there about a year and a half or so when one of my deacons called me and he asked me if, he, if I would do the funeral for a man that he had befriended. Uh, this man... Uh, he got to know my deacon through golf and things like this. Uh, he had never attended church. He was living, uh, he had a common law wife. Uh, and, but this man had just recently accepted Christ through the ministry of this deacon, but again, had passed away kind of suddenly. And so had never really attended church. And so when I was asked by this deacon to come and do this funeral, I had never, I never met the man, not once. And I was asked to do this funeral, and I did not want to know what in the world to talk about until I started talking to his wife. And as I was talking to her about him and everything else, I learned that from her that she learned how to play golf by watching and imitating his swing. And by doing that, she had actually become like a six handicap golfer. And, and if you know anything about golf, you know that that taint too shabby, right? That is pretty good. And so she learns how to do all this, and all of a sudden, I have my in. I know exactly what to talk about and imitating. Uh, in, in Ephesians 5, Paul issues us with the amazing challenge, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. 
This is an amazing challenge for us to exemplify God's righteousness and love and character by living like him. And to be honest, it looks impossible. But Paul reminds us precisely this is what God has asked us to do. Not as a hardship, but as a way of, a loving way of living. And we mimic God because we are his, like cherished children. And we are called to emulate the qualities of our heavenly father, just as children instinctively pick up on their parents' behavior. We got to see that a little bit this past uh, weekend, or week. Uh, I hope you can see that. There we go. Uh, one of our young men in the congregation decided to dress up as his mother uh, for Halloween. And I'll be honest, if you, look, if you look real quick, you can't tell who is who. But imitation, obviously the sincerest form of flattery, right? But how do we even start to do this? How do we imitate God? How can we follow God's path uh, when, we, when we are flawed so greatly? But looking at the rest of our passage, we'll talk about what it means to live in a way that represents God's heart in this message, to allow his kindness and love and mercy to influence our lives. And as his cherished children, let us open our hearts today to think about what it means to mimic God, not out of obligation, but out of a close relationship with him. And let's accept this invitation to become more intimate with him and become the individuals he made us to be. And we can do this first and foremost by imitating God with our words. Verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. The, the truthfulness that Paul is calling us to here is more than just avoiding lies. It is about a commitment to honesty in our relationships with others. As the last six months of political campaigning has proven, our culture easily falls into patterns of deception, whether by telling outright lies or half-truths or simply withholding information to manipulate outcomes. But as members of the body of Christ, we are to be people of truth. And why? Because God is a God of truth. Jesus himself declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And as his followers... We are called to reflect his truthfulness. Speaking truthfully is essential in maintaining unity in the body of Christ. When we lie, even in small ways, we damage the trust that binds us together. But speaking truth isn't always easy. It often means confronting someone or being vulnerable about our own struggles and failures. But as Christians, we are called to embrace honesty even when it's uncomfortable. Being truthful means that we are willing to hold someone accountable. As members of one body, we are responsible for encouraging each other in the walk of truth and to reflect Christ in every area of our lives. Our commitment to truth reflects our commitment to God and it strengthens the unity that we have as believers. And a loving truthfulness is humble and caring guiding others towards healing and not division. And it starts with self-examination. Matthew gives us the perfect thing of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to examine ourselves according to Matthew 7. Before we remove the speck out of our brother's eye, we need to remove the log out of our own. But then we go to Matthew 18, and we go immediately, and we do what's laid out there. When we know there's something that needs to be, in, be talked about, we go to that person individually, one-on-one, -on -one, and we hope that fixes it. And if it doesn't, then we take two others with us. And if that doesn't fix it, you bring it to the elders of the church. God has given us the blueprint for that. But then in verse 29, it moves on to let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. One of the greatest gifts God has given us is the power of speech. Words can comfort us, inspire us, and guide us. But words can also wound, tear down, and divide. Whoever made that little rhyme, but words will never hurt me, that is a lie from the pit of hell. In Ephesians 4.29, Paul addresses 
how the church should speak about each other. Now, full disclosure, this is an extremely hard passage for me to speak on because I am a constant violator of this principle. First of all, I'm a member of Generation X and our love language is sarcasm. But I was also blessed or cursed, depending on which moment it is, with a sharp wit and a mouth that can run at 100 miles an hour and a brain that runs at five. <laughs> but we are called to avoid any corrupting talk. And, and what does Paul mean by that? He, he uses a Greek word here called sapros. It refers to something rotten or corrupt. It's used often to describe food that has spoiled, something unfit to be consumed. And Paul urges us to be mindful that our words aren't spoiled with gossip or negativity or anger or deception. These kinds of words don't nourish. They spoil relationships and trust and unity. We live in a world filled with cynicism and sarcasm and complaint and sometimes outright hatred. And again, we've seen it so much in just the last little bit. In just this past week, I saw a video of a woman screaming at a child because her father was going to vote for the, opponent, the, the opposite opponent of what she was supporting. We've seen horrible words be used by both sides to describe each other. One time, I, I want one election. I, I know this will never happen in my lifetime. I want both people to agree. I'm only going to talk about good things and positive things and what I actually want to be. Instead of, I want to talk about all the negative things I can talk about. One time. Paul tells us that we need to resist this temptation to speak in such a way. We are called to discern what comes out of our mouths. And instead of tearing down, we are to build up as fits the occasion. Paul doesn't tell us to stop at what to avoid. He tells us what to aim for. And the Greek word for build up is oikodomeo, easy for me to say, which means to construct or to edify. Paul is saying that our words should be like the stones that build up a church, creating a foundation of encouragement and strength and love. And building up means being aware of an individual's needs and, and speaking in a way that meets them where they are. It requires us to listen and empathize, not just offering superficial compliments. It's about us asking ourselves, what would truly uplift this person? What would encourage them in their faith? And, and our speech should both build up our brothers and sisters in Christ and all others who are not in Christ. Every image bearer has needs and hurts and struggles that are often hidden beneath the surface. And when we speak in ways that build up others according to their needs, we create a community of support where each person is seen and valued and loved. And then we're supposed to imitate God with our actions. Uh, this is verses 26 through, through uh, 5, 2. I'm not going to read it again. But we just need to understand as we go through these little parts. The first is 26 and 27. How do we do this in our actions? First of all, we deal with our anger Paul acknowledges something essential. Anger is part of the human experience. Now, anger in and of itself is not sin. God displays righteous anger throughout Scripture. But there's a difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger. And Paul calls us to be careful with our response. There are times when we should be angry. If there are injustices like corruption or human trafficking or murder or in the world, or if we, in our context here, if we see God's word being misused in the big C church, we need to acknowledge something's wrong and that should make us angry and lead us to do something. We can also be angry when we have been personally wronged. But Paul makes a distinction. It's not the anger itself that leads us astray. It's how we handle it. Paul warns us not to allow our anger to simmer and then boil over explosively. We can't let it become a doorway for the devil or for bitterness or for hatred. So how do we handle anger? Paul suggests a proactive approach. Deal with it. 
forgive those who have wronged you after confronting them and move forward in God's grace. Again, we go back to the Matthew 7 and Matthew 18 passages. This approach doesn't call for denial or repression, but for comp confrontation with compassion. It means addressing the issues with humility and seeking restoration. To imitate God in this way is to let go of anger and embrace peace, just as God has shown us mercy and grace in Christ. And then we're to live a life of integrity, in verse 28, Paul calls us to live a life of integrity where our work is honorable and beneficial, not only to ourselves, but also to those around us. Honest work in whatever field we are called to is of great benefit to the world around us. And there is no unimportant positions. One of the neat things in the time that I spent with my mom while she was in the hospital, she made this observation. She'll love the fact that I'm saying this. Uh, but as we were sitting there and somebody came in to take the trash out of the room and she n remarked how many people had come through her room that day and all of them were different in different areas. The surgeon had come in to talk about the surgery. The nurses had come in to comfort and care and everything there. The, the, the person who was going to be uh, there when we were going to be dismissed, discharged from the, uh, the hospital had come in and said, here's the procedure. And then here's this person coming to clean the room there were probably no less than 30 people who at some point in those two days that we were there came in and out of that room. And every one of them was vital to that. Our work has great benefit. The goal of honest work is so that we may have something to share with anyone in need. Imitating God means transforming our purpose from self-service to self-giving. And then in verses 31 and 32, Paul moves on to talking about bitterness and wrath and being kind and tenderhearted and forgiving one another. Here we have a call to inner transformation. Imitating God is more than acting just kindly on the outside. It is cleansing our hearts of anything that disrupts our connection with him and with his children. We must allow God to work on us from the inside, making our inner lives reflect his peace and his holiness. And as we allow God to grow us in grace, traits like kindness and tenderheartedness and forgiveness will naturally flow from it. There's this great quote from uh, the Harry Potter series where the, the headmaster Dumbledore is looking at Harry and he says, you're just like your mother, you're unfailingly kind. A trait people never fail to undervalue. Kindness is important because it reflects the core teachings of Jesus and embodies the values of compassion and mercy and love for others. It reflects God's love. When Christians act with kindness, they mirror God's love and his patience and his grace, helping others feel valued and loved. And it fulfills Jesus' teaching. Jesus taught his followers, love your neighbor as yourself. Treat them with compassion. It's a central message. And this message builds community and connection. It strengthens relationship and fosters unity. Being kind, Christians can bring people together and create a supportive environment. And it can ease struggles and, and, and can do remarkable things. Our kindness can probably get us further than our teaching. It leads others to faith. It counters negativity in the world. The church should be a place, and the people of the church should be a people who are able to go out in this world of negativity and bring positive and bring good things to it address suffering and injustice, provide hope and healing in a way that honors God. And another part of our transformation will be that it leads us to be people of forgiveness. We can and we must forgive others because Christ, who is perfect, extended forgiveness to each of us without hesitation. Imitating God means that we extend the same mercy to those around us as we have received from Christ himself. 
Forgiveness allows us to move past pain and resentment and grudges, which only leads to being spiritually and emotionally draining. When we forgive, we let go of the negative emotions that are damaging ourselves and others. Forgiveness leads to healing and reconciliation, both in personal relationships and within communities. Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch... Uh, she, she and her sister would hide Jewish people in World War II. She got captured, she got sent to prison along with her sister. Pr sister died in prison, in, in the concentration camp. She returned to Germany in 1947 to speak on God's forgiveness, and she recounts this, so I'm going to be speaking as her for the next minute or so. She says, after the speech, uh, and uh, shortly after uttering the words, when we confess our sins, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And there I was greeted by a man that I immediately recognized as a guard where I'd been in prison and where my sister died. He said to her, you mentioned Ra Ravensbrück in your talk, he said. I was a guard in there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I've become a Christian, and I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, again his hand came out, will you forgive me? And I stood there, I, I who sin had every day to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, held, hand held out. But to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has pri a prior condition. That we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men and their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And I stood there with my coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I threw my hand into the one stretched out to me, and as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. For a moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner, I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. God's word can do amazing things. And it can lead us to walking in love. And this love that Paul is talking about in verse 2 of chapter 5, it's not just an emotional love, it's a self-giving love. And Christ's love was demonstrated on the cross for us. Jesus said, "By everyone will know this, that if you are my disciples, they will know you if you love one another. We live in a world marked by division and hatred, and our love should stand out. Love is not just a word or an idea or a feeling. It is an action. It requires us to be self-sacrificial, to love, to do good things, to care. And if we do all of those things, if we don't do the things that have been spoken about, don't do. And if we do do the things that Paula said, please do. This is the answer to the question, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? We will not grieve the Holy Spirit if we do the right things and don't do the wrong things. It's that simple. How do we put these things into practice? First of all, we need to have a commitment to honesty. As we go about our week and our days and our years, let us examine our commitment to truth. 
We need to be willing to resolve anger quickly. We need to deal with it, and then we need to forgive. We need to be willing to forgive. I am sure that in here, in this room, there's at least one person other than me that is right now thinking of that person they need to call this afternoon. We need to live a life of love. As we leave here today, let's remember that our actions matter and that our lives are a testimony uh, to the world of, of who God is. And as we reflect on God's kindness and forgiveness, we pray that others would be drawn to him through our example. Amen and amen.